chairmanship. Imagine how anxious somebody must feel knowing, knowing that they are going to have to sit through an interrogation process to deem whether or not they are quite disabled enough to be eligible for a helping hand. Not only does this person have the already huge day-to-day -day disadvantage of being disabled or suffering from mental illness, but now, thanks to our government, they have to be forced to sit through a point scoring system to judge whether or not they are deemed fit to work. PIP is not fit for purpose when it comes to many physical conditions, and it certainly hasn't been fit for purpose when it has come to those suffering invisible illnesses. How disgraceful that in 21st century Britain, we have a government implementing public policies that clearly disadvantage those with mental health problems. My constituent, George, suffers from a range of debilitating conditions. He is prescribed a huge amount of medication just to be able to get through the day. George is also almost completely reliant on the use of a wheelchair. After working his entire life, George, at 63, felt that when his health deteriorated, there would be support to help him to survive and pay his bills. At first, that support was there, and George received his higher rate mobility and the highest rate care component of disability living allowance. However, when called for his PIP assessment, this is when things took a dramatic turn for the worst. George wouldn't mind me saying that he is now reaching an age where he would be likely to reti retire soon if he was fit and well, and yet he has been put through a process where he was tested to see if he was disabled enough. One point that was observed during his assessment was that George could walk unaided for 20 metres, although not 50. This, therefore, is not considered a restriction to his ability to walk. The charity for disabled people, Leonard Cheshire, made the point that the change to this criteria obviously means far fewer individuals qualify for the enhanced mobility component of the benefit, penny-pinching at the expense of someone's dignity. They have also gathered information that 74% of people, disabled people surveyed reported that they did not feel the assessor understood their disability. And this was and remains one of George's biggest frustrations. He did not feel that the assessor listened to him, understood his needs, or treated him with any compassion. How can someone hold so much weight in determining the future of someone's life without being held accountable? Also, why can assessors not why can assessors not consult with experts in any condition or disability to help fill their own knowledge gaps? This would surely ensure they ask the right questions in the assessments and accurately, accurately determine the individual's ability to carry out an actively reliable, repeatedly, safely and in a timely manner. Now, I'm, I'm going to just get through it, sorry, because I know it's taking time. George was assessed by Atos on the 1st of June 2017. He is now going through the process of appeal, but the time scale is being put further and further back, and he still does not have a day to be heard. He is struggling to survive financially, and he has expressed how he is feeling more depressed every day and having sleepless nights. He has stated, and this is the important bit to me, that if it was not for his wife, he does not feel that he could go on any more and has contemplated not taking his necessary medication. The way that he and many, many, many others in my constituency have been treated is absolutely diabolical, and I urge the government to seriously stop burying their heads in the sand and face up to the reality that has been created by their own policies. Yeah, yeah.